hear me? Not that I probably need this mic. Okay, I only got 20 minutes, which means I have to usually move very, very fast. And anybody who was in the class yesterday has already experienced that. I was going to talk about concurrency, but there's a couple talks already. So I thought it would be fun to show off a little profiling and to talk a little bit about escape analysis. I think escape analysis is lost on some developers, but what the language is really trying to do is give you a syntax so you don't have to think about these things. But if I asked all of you if performance mattered, you'd all raise your hand, right? Performance does matter, which means sometimes the allocations that our software is creating matter, and if we have an opportunity to reduce those allocations, well, we should take that opportunity. Again, I want to stress, we're always going to be optimizing for correctness, which means integrity, readability, and simplicity is our first priority. But yes, performance matters. That's why you're in this room. You hear Go is really fast. So we're going to go on. Now, this is a language that uses pointers. And pointers are important. They give us the ability to have efficiency, to share. When I hear the word pointer, I want you to just hear the word share. That's what pointers are for, sharing. Now, I want to show you real quick here couple pieces of code here. Look at that function right there. It's called create user version one and I've got a version two. They're creating a user value and returning it back up the call stack to the caller. Now in this first version I would say we're using value semantics here. We're creating a value. It's there. It's owned by this function and this function decides that it's going to take a copy of this value and pass it up to the caller which means the caller has their own copy. Everything is fine here. But I want you to look at the second function. The second function is using pointer semantics. It's creating that same value, but instead of giving the caller its own copy, it's sharing it back up to that caller, which means now that caller is going to have indirect access to it. The problem is, is when we go back up the call stack, this memory right here that we were using is no longer valid. So what the compiler is going to do for us so we don't have to think about these things and stay productive is decide that this value is going to end up on the heap. Values can be in two places in memory, on the stack and on the heap. We're just keeping it simple. So in this first version, these values get to stay on the stack because every function gets its own copy, and those functions operate within their own stack frame. But in this next one, because we're sharing it up, we can't leave it on the stack frame. It's going to be moved out to the heap. Now, there's nothing wrong with the heap. Sometimes we're like, oh, it's on the heap because there's allocations. But we need the heap. We want to share things. And we need a balance between these two things. And so what we can imagine is the following in this code. In the first function, what we're doing is that user function has a user value. It's right there on its frame. And it passes it back up. And main ends up getting its own copy. But when we're looking at that second function, we might think that this is happening. This would be bad. When we share that value up, we can't be pointing to it down because once we go back up, that memory down here in this frame is really no longer valid. And so we can kind of imagine, it's hard to imagine this because the syntax really gives you the, gives you the idea that u is a value on the heap, but we have to have pointer access to it. So we can imagine really what's going to happen is escape analysis is going to come in and it's going to decide that that value can't stay on the frame. It's got to go into the heap and we're going to be accessing that on the heap. So I want us to understand something. The con Go is about convention over configuration. It's really beautiful. Okay? And so how you write your code is going to determine determine what the escape analysis algorithm is going to decide in terms of whether that value is on the stack and the heap. And this is really nice. We can be very productive while we're writing code. But what I want to do is show you another program that was interesting. I decided one day I wanted to learn more about the I.O. package. I don't get to do streaming very much uh, in my day-to-day -day life. And what happens is I probably, if you really look at the work you're doing, maybe you know a handful of packages and go pretty well, and there's a bunch there you just never get to touch. And, and it's the same thing. And you hear about how amazing the I.O. package is, and I wanted to play with it. So I said, let's do the following. Let's take a, a, a set of bytes, like a stream of bytes right here, and we'll have this whole stream. We'll put it together, and we'll have Elvis's name in it. And you know, the Elvis is the king, so we can't allow his name to ever show up without it being capitalized. So we're going to find this stream. We're going to find Elvis. We're going to put that capital E in front of the stream. And then, boom, we're going we're to play with the I.O. package. So, I spent about a half an hour, and I came up with this algorithm. And it was just, again, I was just playing a little bit with the I.O. package. So it's very, 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 very just, I'm going to get a bytes buffer. I'm going to find the length of the string we're looking to find. 
I'm going to create another little buffer there in between, and I'm using the read full functions, which allow me to read a certain number of bytes based on the length of the slice. So here the idea was read, the, read in the first four bytes, and then if we get at least four bytes, you know, we're, we're pretty good. If not, eh. And then we just go into an endless loop, reading one byte at a time. We're going to compare these bytes, and we're going to just keep going. And it worked. I was like, OK, that's pretty cool. I got my first little function together with IO read full. Life was good. And I asked the Go community, hey, how would you guys solve this problem? And one of my friends, Tyler, reached out. And now remember, I had the IO constraint on me. I wanted to play with the IO package. And Tyler comes in and says, you know what, I'm going to use a reader. And I'm going to find that length. And, and what Tyler did was really interesting. He said, I'm going to loop here. And I'm going to read one byte at a time. And then I'm just going to compare um, these bytes inside of this find. And if I get five matches, boom, I must have Elvis. So he's, you know, he's, he's getting this index count. And he's going in. And he's using read byte. And he's, he's um, doing this stuff. And sure enough, his algorithm works. So what's really beautiful here is I've got two different algorithms now that solve the same problem, one with the I.O. package, one without. So I asked Tyler, I said, dude, did you benchmark your program? I'd be curious to see how your, how your algorithm does compared to mine. He said, no, I didn't do that. So I said, you know what, I'm going to write a couple of benchmarks. And I, sure enough, I went in, I created a test file, and I added some benchmarks that assemble the streams, and we run that. So what I'm going to do here is show you the benchmark that we had. So go test, and I'm not going to run any tests. We're going to run both benchmarks. I'm going to up the bench time to three seconds. And we're going to look at bench memory. All right, so this one's mine, algorithm one. There it is. And OK, not so bad, 2,500 nanoseconds per op, 117 bytes per op with two values out there in the heap. And Tyler writes a zero allocation algorithm. Now, I tell Tyler on the phone that he did this. And next thing we know, we're dancing in our offices. We're like, oh my god, like, 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 that's not that easy to do in the first place. And you did it out of the box. So we're all really happy. And then I hang up the phone, and my happiness drops. I'm like, I didn't write a zero allocation algorithm. I'm teaching every week. What's going on? So I now decide I want to know where these allocations are. Apparently, something is escaping, or two things, two values are escaping to the heap. And I want to know where they are. So this is one of the most beautiful things here. I can ask for a memory profile. So I ask the benchmark, OK, run this again, but give me a memory profile so we can start to inspect where these two allocations are in my algorithm. So we're running it again. And once this thing runs, what we're going to end up with is two files. We're going to get the, the mem.out file that I asked for. But we're also going to get a memcpu.test, which is a binary for the test that so we can read the symbols out while we do some profiling. OK, here we go. It would be really interesting to know where these allocations are, right? Maybe we can fix the code and speed this thing up. Because if you notice, he's also running like, what, three point something times faster than me, too without all of that. So let's do the following. Now that I have all this stuff, I can go into the pprof tool. Now, when I go in the pprof tool looking at memory, I need to um, choose Alex space here. By default, it's in use space. I don't particularly care what was in there. I want to look at every potential allocation that occurred. So I'm going to look for the Alex space. I need that binary, which took the name of the folder I was in. And we're going to look at mem.out. So there we are. I am now in this interactive mode with the pprof. It has all of my information. What I want to do is look exactly at my algorithm. So I'm going to just tell you the list command. Now, it uses a regular expression. It's only going to find alg1. But boom, here it is. And I now know the location of these algorithms. It looks like input is allocating. And it looks like something around my buff slice is allocating. OK, let's focus on one of these at a time. Now, we might think off the top of our head, well, I understand line 83. We're calling a function, new buffer. And if we look at this new buffer function, we might say to ourselves, OK, well, we're making a call down the stack. And new buffer returns a pointer. So it must be escaping because this is going up. And we can think initially that might be the problem. Except there's something that's bothering me on this report. And what's bothering me is this flat column. This flat column tends to indicate to me 
that this allocation is coming from inside Al Guan, not outside. The cumulative numbers mean everything that's happening here down, but this is telling me right off my head that it's got to be happening here. Now, this is odd to me, so what we're going to do is the following. The profile can only tell me what is allocating. It can't really indicate why, but I've got a working Go program here. So we can use some special flags on the command line and get a report from the compiler about escape analysis. All we have to use is GC flags. Now, there's multiple levels of M for this. I like using two. Go beyond two, and it's just overwhelming. But all of this information just came out of the compiler about my program. Now, what line of code was that input on? The input was in a file called stream.go on line 83. So really quickly, what I'm just going to do is say stream.go colon 83, and some things are going to pop out of here right out of the box. In fact, there's one right here. Oh, I just ruined that. Boom. All right. So this line right here is really interesting to me. If I were to isolate this, maybe I can highlight it for you here. What it's saying is that this call is being inlined. Ah, inline. What does that mean? It means the compiler decided that we're not making a function call here. All the code we would have been making a function call in gets brought right inside the code. So that basically means if we look at this code real quick, this call that we were making to new buffer, let's go to the definition, is this line of code here, essentially, and of course this would be bytes dot buffer with an S. This is essentially what's happening. Ah, oh, this makes sense now because this function owns the value thanks to the inlining, which now makes more sense to me on this flat call. So now I can understand why we looked at this report here, which I cannot scroll anymore. All right, we'll do it again. So now I understand why it's saying input is allocating from this function. I still don't know why, but at least I, I understand now that this function owns the value. So let's go back and look at the report and see if we can find more information about this allocation. Now, these lines of code right here are very interesting in the report. What this is saying is that that bytes buffer value that we are creating on line 83 is escaping to the heap because of line 93 that this value is being converted into an interface. Now, I don't remember using an interface, but let's look at line 93 to see what's potentially happening there. And if I look at line 93, what we see is the call to io.readfull. And what we see is readfull is accepting data through the interface type reader. There's our interface conversion. So it looks like the use of IO read full is causing the allocation. And it looks like the use of the interface is creating the allocation. But I want to understand something. This doesn't mean we don't use interfaces. Interfaces add huge, huge support in our code for decoupling, for architecture and design. And so for me, the cost of allocation when the interface is adding that kind of value is worth it every time. But let's go back to this because Tyler didn't allocate anything at all. And if I, know, if I look at Tyler's algorithm, I notice one thing. He is using the method set of the reader in this entire al uh, algorithm. He's using the method set. There's nothing causing input to, to allocate outside of this frame. So maybe what we can do, because IO isn't that important to me, I was using it to learn, Maybe we can use as the API for buffer, and sure enough, this has a method set too, and it's got a function called read, so we could replace these calls fairly quickly with these methods. Let's see. This is going to use this. We're going to get these read calls, read full calls out of our life for a second. We'll do this. And we've got one more here, which is the same as this. So we'll just pull that in. And I'm going to get rid of all of these calls. 
And what we'll do is I have a syntax error here, right, because we still have to call uh, And we were passing data in there, weren't we? Okay. So if we come back here now and run that benchmark again, let's see what happens. Okay. We're down to just the one alloc. So for sure that allocation went away because we're using the method set. And if you notice, we actually got faster. Those two allocations were causing somewhere about a 28% uh, slowdown about from where we were. So just getting rid of those two allocations help. But I still got one more allocation here. And so let's go back into the profiler one more time and see if we can understand what's happening um, there again. So I'm going to list alg1. There it is. We're now down to this. Now there's, a, there's something really interesting about the compiler here and that what we know is that a value can only be on the stack if the compiler knows the size of it at compile time. Now, I'm using a variable here to denote the size of the backing array for this slice. So this could be the reason of the allocation, but I want to validate this. And so I'm going to go back again and do the GC flags report that is on line 88 so if I search for line 88 here what we now see is the compiler telling us that it's too large for the stack now that's kind of misleading to me it's not that it's too large for the stack in my head in my head it's because the compiler doesn't know the size but let's validate this with hard coding a value right now in this algorithm and so if I just say 5, I know that's safe right now for the data I'm processing. We just say 5, and we run this benchmark one more time. Do we get rid of all of our allocations? Now, my algorithm can't get rid of this last one because it needs that size value. And so if I'm going to keep this algorithm at this point, this is what I'm stuck at, right? The one alloc. But hey, I didn't get that much more of a performance improvement with this one. So if it's fast enough, I'm good to go. But this tooling in Go is pretty amazing because it allows you to write this code. I want you to focus on optimizing for you know, integrity, readability, and simplicity. And then once we get this working program, you know, we can look at this. Now, I'm still a little interested in understanding why Tyler is still almost twice as fast as I am. So why don't we do the following while we have time? Let's look at a CPU profile of, of these algorithms here. Oops. Now, let's see if we can identify why he's still running faster uh, than us and his algorithm there. So, those, out, so those, those are gone. We're doing it again. And this time now, I've got a CPU um, out file produced by the benchmark tool. OK, great. So let's do the following. Go tool, pprof. Now, I don't need any extra switches for the CPU um, profile. I just need the binary. I need cpu.out. Here we are, now I'm here. Now, what will be nice is I want to get a global view of what's happening between these two, these two algorithms. So if I type web, what's going to be cool is I'm going to jump into this call graph, and I'll zoom into this call graph, and what we're going to look at is potential things that might be interesting on the performance side. So my algorithm is there on the left, and uh, Tyler's is on the right, and it doesn't look like my call graph is too deep, which is sometimes what I'm looking at. But we do see that I've got a bytes compare that he doesn't have there. And it looks like this runtime compare body is eating up a whole second. It looks like this read is, is causing. So let's do the following. Let's go back and look at our list command, see if we can um, see some more details about this. And so if I look at this report here, I'm seeing that this read right here is causing me 1.41 seconds, and the compare is a little bit more. 
But this read up here is interesting to me. I mean, I'm only trying to read one byte. And I know that there's a method called read byte here. So maybe the read byte call is a little more efficient than this read full call. I'm not going to be able to get rid of bytes compare just yet, but it would be interesting if we were able to do something like this and if it would help at all. So let's come back in here for a second. And let's say that we want to read the, uh, use the read byte call right here. All right, now read byte's going to bring back a byte and I need to put it into this same location here. So I could do something like this and I could then declare an error variable up here and that could now give me that byte. I still want to check that error, right? So maybe we can just say if the error doesn't equal nil here. Maybe that would work. And we'll see if we get any compiler errors. Likes this code. So I'm going to try to just read byte, put it in that position, check the error, and see if we get any better performance now by doing that. All right, so we'll leave this. We'll run the benchmark one more time. We'll get that CPU profile at the same time. We were at about 16 something before this change. Ah, uh, so we shaved like another 100 nanoseconds per op on this. And when I go back and look at this report, the original one, we were at about 1.14 seconds. So if we come back in here and list ALG1, did we get any real improvement? Yeah, I almost cut it in half. So that's interesting, right? That read byte call is a lot more efficient than the whole read full call there. And I was able to shave. Now, I am shaving like, this is micro optimizations, right? Like that 100 nanoseconds per op really doesn't matter at all in the overall algorithm, right? Now, from my perspective, I'm almost wasting time here, right? There are more important things I could be doing than this. But what I'm trying to show you is that if you were to run a larger profile, and suddenly a, a function came in and you were like, this is a hot function and I want to work on this function here. You don't have to worry about constantly putting that same kind of load over the larger program. You could take that function, isolate it into a benchmark, and then from the benchmark do these types of op optimizations and prototyping and testing different ideas until you feel like the algorithm is where it needs to be. So I really love this tooling. I love Go so much. And, and I think it's important here Again, just to stress one more time, you cannot write code with a first priority on performance. The language is really designed for us to write code with integrity, readability, and simplicity in mind, optimizing for correctness. And readability to me means two things. Two things. One, that the average developer on your team can comprehend all the code that's being written. The average developer. And everybody's got to be honest about who they are on that team. You put me on a crypto team, I'm at the bottom. I've got a lot of work to come up. You put me on a team that's maybe building business CRUD-based apps, I'm probably on the other side, and I've got to come back to the middle. So we have to be very honest about who we are, who we're bringing on our teams, and readability means that average developer can comprehend all the code. Readability also means that we're not hiding the cost or impact of the code we're writing. We're not generalizing things. We're not tucking things away for the sake of simplicity. Because simplicity is important, but simplicity means, not, it means hiding complexity. And if you hide complexity and lose readability, then what are we gaining? From my world, we're gaining nothing. And so these things all have to be in balance. But hopefully you guys have got to see a little bit of the, of the tooling here in Go. Allows you to inspect your code. You do not have to guess about performance because once you have a working program, guess what? Go will tell you. And that's it. Thank you. I have no questions. I'll, I'll take questions 